lot of people have that question, you know, how do I make sure that I get to heaven? What do I do? How do I get saved? What does this born again thing mean, right? And um, there's so many religions and there's so many doctrines that it can be confusing, confusing to people. So it's important to go back to what the Bible says because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. So we want to listen to him, amen, the Messiah. But you know what? The, the disciples asked Jesus the same question. What must I do to be saved? It says that in Scripture. So we're going to find out what the Bible actually says about salvation for your educational purposes. Because God doesn't want you to just be saved. He wants you to lead other people to him as well so that we can grow as a body of Christ. The only thing we can take to heaven with us is other people. Hallelujah. So if you gave your life to the Lord to get today, you get to go to heaven with all of us Christians that have committed our life to the Lord as well. That's exciting. Hallelujah. But we want you to bring your family and friends with you. Amen. So we're going to find out what the Bible says about salvation. And I want you to understand, first of all, that that story that I told you that sin entered into this world through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where God created man from the dust of the earth. He gave them a free will. You might wonder, God made them perfect, then why did they sin? Well, because if we don't have a free will, then we're not perfect. We have to have the ability to choose right from wrong. We have to have, we don't want to be robots. You know, we're in the day of AI and a lot of robots are being made, you know. So now it's like people are acting as God. I can create this robot person, but they don't have a free will. They got to do what they're programmed to do. And so I'm happy that I get to choose the Lord. It wouldn't be really fair if we didn't get to choose. Hallelujah. So God loves us and he wants us to have a relationship with him. And he wants us to actually choose him, not be forced to choose him, not be forced to follow him, not be forced to do the right thing. We need to be able to choose righteousness over sin. Well, what happened, as I said, was the serpent tricked Eve into disobeying God. He said, did God tell you not to eat of this tree? And he says, uh, and she said, yes, he said, don't eat it, else we will die. And he talked her into eating it anyway. He talked her into eating you know, uh, uh, doing the very thing that God said not to do, else you die. Wow. He must have been pretty manipulative. He talked her into eating it anyway. He said there are many benefits from eating the fruit. Number one, he said you're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. Number two, it's going to make you wise. You're going to be like God. And number four, she saw also that it looked so delicious, good to eat. So she took and she ate it. She gave it to her husband. He ate it too. So they both sinned against God. And then sin entered into the world, as I said earlier. And so they passed that sin down from generation to generation. I'm so glad God came up with a plan of reconciliation to bring us back in to communication with him. Hallelujah. So we get to choose salvation or we get to reject it. If you, if you chose it today, congratulations again because you had a choice. You had a choice to say, God, here I am. My creator, save me from my sin. Or you can choose to do whatever you want to do and reject God and disobey just like they did in the garden. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I just pray that all hearts are open right now to receive your word, that the hearts are prepared to be good ground, to receive your word as a seed again, planted into that ground and produce a harvest, and produce spiritual fruit. We'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, so first of all, I like to base everything that I say today 
on this scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I'm going to be sharing several scriptures with you today that's God's word for our life about salvation. The first one is Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You should say, thank you, God. Thank you for that free gift. Verse 9 says, Not by works, so that no man can, no one can boast. So we can't just work our way into heaven by trying to be a good person. A lot of people are deceived by thinking that. Well, if we just go up to somebody in public and we say, you know, do you think you're going to heaven? Most of them will say yes. And we say, why? They're going to say, well, because I believe in God and I'm a good person. But according to scripture, that's not good enough to get you into heaven. We're going to find out why. So the number one thing that we need to do first, as we see in the scripture, is believe. So what do we believe? The devil believes in God, and he sure isn't in heaven. Therefore, it can't just stop with believing that God exists. It's not enough just to believe that God exists. No one can just simply believe that God exists in order to be a Christian just because they go to church. Well, I've been going to church all my life, sitting there in the pew, keeping the seat warm, Never having a relationship truly with the Lord. That's how I was as a child. Just listening, but not really receiving. But that doesn't make you a Christian. Just like sitting in your garage and believing that you're a car does not mean that you're a car, right? So what do you have to believe? First of all, that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah. You can go back and look at that prophecy. It's in Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. And then the fulfillment of that prophecy when Jesus came is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And you can go back and read those, but we need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah. Hallelujah. Okay, now the second one is that we need to believe that Jesus is not only the only begotten Son of God, but was also a perfect sinless man that was born of a virgin woman named Mary, and therefore God became flesh on this earth. That is in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14, which says, In the beginning was the, uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. So this was Jesus Christ, the light of the world. He was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was a perfect man, and the fullness of the Godhead dwelt within him. It's Colossians 2, verse 9. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So I want you to understand that the, you know, this concept that if you know, that a son of a whale is a whale. The son of a cow is a cow. The son of a person is a person. Well, the son of God is God. Hallelujah. And the next one is that we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, being crucified by his own people. You'll find that in Luke chapter 23 and 24. And he was raised from the dead three days later. You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. 
So if we believe that Jesus Yeshua is the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah, a sinless man, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, and that he died on the cross being crucified by his own people and was raised from the dead three days later. The next thing to understand is that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice called the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. You're going to find that in John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible also says, For whoever believes, trusts, and obeys his word will be saved. Okay? Hallelujah. So that's what we need to do. We need to believe those things first. And then the next thing we need to do is to confess with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord, just like you did earlier, hopefully. So the word Lord here in this scripture means your ultimate master, which you are to obey above all things, above all authorities, above all power. Not because you're forced to, but because you love him and you desire to. Okay, the next one is that you also need to confess. We need to confess that we're a sinner. According to Romans 3, 23, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. We all have sinned and we all need a Savior. Hallelujah. So let's read, actually, let's go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 11. Uh, I, read, I, I quoted earlier to you. It says, now, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's why it's important to speak it, okay, if you're able to. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Hallelujah. Another translation says, whoever believes in him, will not be ashamed. Same thing as be put to shame. Now, number three, after we have confessed him as our Lord and our Savior, and we confess that we're sinners, and we confess our sin to him, we now need to, re we need to repent of our sin. I remember years ago when I first got saved, you know, I thought repent, it meant to ask for forgiveness. I was wrong. Repent actually means to turn to God away from your sin. Turn to God's will, surrendering your own will to him. In Acts 2.38, it says, repent and be baptized. And then Acts chapter 3.19 says, it talks about repenting and being converted that repentance process. So our hearts need to be converted. We need to be born again. The Bible says in John 3, 6, that flesh is born of flesh and spirit is born of spirit. So we must be born again by the Spirit of God. We become a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. I remember that was my experience. All that junk, all that sin just passed away. The evil heart of unbelief or believing the wrong things, thinking the wrong things, doing the wrong thing. I had no desire for any of that anymore. And God gave me a new spirit on the inside. And I seen everything so differently. I had appreciation for his creation. I'd walk outside and look at the beautiful sky and recognize it now. Ah, your creation is so beautiful and the grass is so green and, and it just really came alive to me. And then when I started reading his word, the word started jumping off the pages at me like, wow, I never read that before. I never understood that before. It's so cool. Because the Bible says deep calls unto deep. When you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you read the word of God, you feel that connection with his word. And we'll still have troubles in our flesh because we have the enemy attacking our mind and the feelings of our flesh we deal with. But we have the Holy Spirit who gives us strength and guidance, comfort, peace. 
or a new person on the inside. And you know it because your life, your heart, your focus, and everything changes in your inner being when you fall in love with Jesus, when you commit to obey his word. Things shift on the inside. Okay, now the, the next thing after we repent and turn to him away from our sins and submit our will to his is forgiveness. Okay? First, we need to ask him to forgive us of our sins but and pray and confess your sins. We say, Father, I know I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. But the Bible also says in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse number 9, that we need to forgive others so that he can forgive us. So we can't be holding on to stuff. When we confess our sin to him, we need to forgive others when we invite him into our heart. Don't hold a grudge against anybody. He says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will, will your, your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay? So we need to forgive others right now if we want him to forgive us. Matter of fact, I would just say it. If you're holding a grudge against a person, just say it out loud, God, by faith. Even though they don't deserve it, you still say it. By faith, I forgive them. I, re I, I release them to you. And don't hold it against them. And God, please forgive me for holding a grudge. See, that forgiveness, it's not just for the other person, it's for you. It's to set you free and to provide forgiveness for you. Hallelujah. And you got to really mean it in your heart. You know, when you forgive people and ask God to forgive you. The next thing is water baptism. This is all part of our, 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 our salvation journey. The word baptism is actually baptisma in the Greek. And it means immersed in water versus being sprinkled, you know, as a baby like some of us have been. You know, being sprinkled as a baby is not going to send you to hell, you know, but... If you think that it's all you need and you don't and you don't go get immersed in water after you have believed, then I believe that's a, that's going to weigh on your salvation according to Mark 16:16 16, 16, because it says those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Okay? And those but those who do not believe shall be condemned. So it doesn't say those who get baptized first and then believe. Okay, you need to believe on him. As you see, everybody in Scripture that gave their life to the Lord, they believed on Him and then they got water baptized, the baptism of repentance. They repented of their sins and got saved. So we believe, we confess, we repent, we forgive others, we ask for forgiveness, and we get water baptized after we believe. We get immersed in water. It's a type and shadow of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? When you get baptized, you're dying to self, and then you're coming up to live for God. You agree to take up your cross daily and follow Him. So after you get saved, you want to keep your salvation. That's important, right? And how do we do that? We're about to find out. So the next thing is called obedience. Okay, and you're not going to be able to probably do this all in your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit to help you because the Holy Spirit is going to give you the desire and the power and the guidance so that you can obey the Word of God. Okay? He don't just save us so that we can go out and live a, a life of sin. Okay? He saved us from our sin so that we won't go out and continue in sin. So 2 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 11 and I want to read that to you as well. It says, whoever sins and does not continue in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Mm. Okay, think about it. Whoever sins and does not continue in the teachings of Christ means you're already in Christ. You're already following the teachings of Christ. It says if you don't continue, then you don't have God. He who continues in the teachings of Christ have both the Father and the Son. Hallelujah. Now, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, it says, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Wow. So if we welcome people into our house, 
that do not bring the doctrine of Christ, that's not a Christian, it's basically saying that we are sharing in their evil deeds. So Christians are supposed to be clean, pure, protected, and set apart from the world, but still loving people. And we're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. But I like how Jesus did it. He went to people and he shared his gospel truth with them. I don't see anything in scripture where it says he was sitting in his home and he invited somebody into his home to share the gospel. You know? So he went out, the disciples went out and they shared the gospel of salvation. Hallelujah. So obedience to God's word and continuing in his word is important to retain your salvation. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And that brings us to the next one, which is love. So after obedience, we have love. If you love me, then you'll obey me. So it really seems that love precedes the obedience, because it says, if you love me, then you'll obey me. The Bible even says, faith worketh by love. Okay? John 13, 35 says, they will know you are Christians by your love for one another. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to demonstrate love to one another. The world should see that and recognize that we're Christians because of the love that we have, that we show. Okay? We're not bitter and evil and you know disrespectful and all the, the different things that the world does the Lord saved us from that we have a new spirit we're a new creature on the inside so God gives us the strength by in the leading of his Holy Spirit to do those things to be a light to the world it's all about love as a matter of fact faith is activated by love that's another way to say that faith worketh by love it means activated by love, Galatians 5, 6. And also, remember 1 John, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says that God is love. He is love, the essence of love. So that's why people really don't know how to truly love unless they have God within them, because God is love. There's infatuation, there's liking, there's sexual desires, there's all that kind of stuff, but it's not the true love of God unless you have the love of God because you have God living within you. So we want to operate with love in our heart, with God in our heart, forgiving other people, doing our best to repent of our sin, living right as much as we can as Christians empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're not going to be perfect in the sense of never make a mistake because we live we do live in a sinful world. We still have these temptations. We have these thoughts. We have these feelings. However, we have the Holy Spirit that will guide us and correct us when we make a mistake, when we do something sinful. He will correct us. If, if you have the Holy Spirit living within you and you sin, you're going to feel conviction on the inside. You're not going to be comfortable with it. You're not going to have the same desires anymore as you did before. A spirit-filled Christian actually feels guilty and remorseful when they commit sin. Like, yuck, you know? We won't feel good about our sin. We repent. And we ask for forgiveness. And there's a difference between living a lifestyle of continual willful sin and periodically making a mistake that you feel horrible about and quickly repent of. If we know something is sinful and we keep doing it, that is called willful sin. And listen to what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27 says about willful sin. It says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Wow. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Powerful. So, you know, that's kind of like a parent telling their child that you can't do this, you can't slap your sister 
you know, that's wrong. And they say, I don't care. And they go, smack. And they go, smack. You say, that, that person going to be, that, that child's going to be in a bit of trouble. Okay? So we've got to be careful to make sure that we're doing what we know is right to do. We all commit sins of omission, which means we didn't realize it was wrong. The biggest problem is willful sins of commission. Sins of omission, sins of commission. Sins of commission means you commit sin, you know that you did it and you did it anyway. It's like thumbing your nose at God. And then you have sins of omission. You made a mistake. You find out it was not in God's will. Okay, He didn't mean to do it. You recognize it later. That's sins of omission. And so, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God continually for forgiveness of sins. I do it every day. And I thank Him. Thank you, God. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for the blood of Yeshua that covers my sin. Please forgive me. I repent. I turn to you away from these wicked ways. Help me, strengthen me, because I don't want to do this anymore. And sometimes you do it again and again because you keep trying to repent, but you have this stronghold. A stronghold is anything that's strong that has a hold on your life. And it needs to be broken by the power of God, by the power of his word, through prayer, repentance, seeking him. Get on your face, cry out to the Lord. But know this, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that beautiful? But the problem is, we can leave him and forsake him. Because we're human. And when we do that, we reject God. He says, anyone that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And it says, any branch that does not bear fruit, says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if the branch does not bear good fruit, it's cut off and it's thrown into the fire. So we're supposed to grow up in the Lord and produce fruit so we can make it to heaven. If we're fruitless, it sounds to me like we go to hell. <coughs> so evidence of salvation is that you will produce good fruit. You're going to have the Holy Spirit in you. You're going to be walking in this power and this, this joy of the Lord is going to be upon you. And you're going to share the gospel. You're going to be a giver. You're going to want to give to people. You're going to want to bless people, change other people's lives, bring them to church. You're going to learn to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and just love on the Lord. Like, you're going to be a shining light unto the nations. Okay? It's a beautiful thing. Hallelujah. So, I hope you are encouraged today. And I just want to conclude in prayer. And I want to pray over you. And I want to encourage you again to make sure you like, you subscribe, and put in there, I got saved. Okay? And also, uh, I just look forward to discipling you and helping you with our, our other uh, spiritual discipleship videos to help you uh, be fruitful in your relationship with God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Yeshua. We thank you so much for all the salvations that will come from this video, this teaching. You get all the glory for it, Father. I pray that you strengthen every person that has given their life to you. They've surrendered their heart. They've repented. They've confessed your Son as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I just pray that you guide them and lead them into all righteousness, power, and fruit in their life. And uh, that they'll just be blessed and protected. Their families will be blessed and protected as they surrender to you. We thank you, Lord. We're so excited about this journey. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So God bless you. We'll see you again real soon.